Evan mentioned, this is the sixth annual LDV Summit, um, and we have had a number of awesome video people on the stage, but I did want to take us back to the first video panel that we did here. Um, six years ago, it was on video businesses and if you could actually make money and have a sustainable um, opportunity in the video business. So we started there six years ago. Then we went to video metrics and analytics, because like it's impossible to measure, and how do you manage success? Um, then we went, of course, to OTT. It's the new black. Um, OTT and the shift to cord cutting. Um, then we went to live streaming because Snapchat was having its moment, so we all had to talk about Snapchat, and we actually trained some people on how to use Snapchat um, as part of that. Um, and then we went last year into VR and AR, which seemed so futuristic at the time, but is actually here for all of us. So now um, we're into the future of storytelling, but based on interactive video. Um, and I'm thrilled to have you all here. Um, and I'm sure we're going to learn a lot, so get ready. Um, if you could each um, introduce yourselves, one line about what you do um, at your company and what your company actually does. Uh, yeah, so I'm Dan. Uh, we are YOX. Um, I kind of characterize what we do is Photoshop for interactive video. If you're aware of any sort of uh, creative tools like that, we're, we're kind of a full breadth of interactive features for, for storytelling, um, uh, for brand content. But with the reason why we've been involved here, and actually we won the competitions here... <laughs> Still my thunder. Uh, ...a few years ago, um, because we use computer vision to actually accelerate the process um, of making interactivity. Um, lo and behold, creatives are the people who drive most interesting things in the world, but they're also... Uh, the most lazy. So we use computer vision to speed up the process, accelerate the process of making interactive experiences. Um, and uh, so that's our connection to this as well. Yeah. Okay, one line. <laughs> Go ahead, um, Hi, my name is Tal. I'm uh, the, one of the co-founders and chief product in uh, Echo. We bring a new medium of storytelling to the world. Um, we develop the technology and platform, and we curate and we commission the best creators in the world to make choice-driven entertainment. And hi, I'm Beth Ann Eason. I'm president of Innovid. We are the leading connected TV and digital video advertising platform. And what I do every day, I oversee sales, marketing, and client services. So I get to work with brands like Procter & Gamble, GSK, Ford, uh, Nestle on creating new advertising experiences for digital video and connected TV. So we're doing a tremendous amount of storytelling these days as they create more content. Thank you. Okay, now I'm asking the audience questions because you guys need to wake up a little. So to help um, set the stage for this, um, if you could all raise your hands and say who um, has a television in their house with traditional cable or broadcast. I expect, oh, more than I thought. Okay, um, how many of you used to have television, traditional broadcast cable, and now are a cord cutter? How many of you never, ever, ever had traditional television, true cord neverers, okay? So that's the mix. Um, you have Netflix. You have Hulu. You watch on Roku. You watch on Apple TV. You're not sure what you watch on, but it's cool. Okay. <laughs> um, and Evan did do a little um, snippet from Bandersnatch, but I, it's actually critical to this panel that we talk about Bandersnatch. So how many people watch the Netflix Bandersnatch? Okay, how many of you know a little bit about it, aside from that clip this morning? Okay, great. Um, and then, in the last 24 hours, how many of you watched a video on your laptop, on your mobile phone? How many of you watched an ad on a video on your mobile phone? Okay, so got a lot of video enthusiasts out there. And then my last question is, how many of you purchased something online this past week, any product, service, ticket, experience this week? And how many of you watched a video before you made the purchase? All right, there you go. So now on to Bandersnatch, interactive video, and the rest. Um, I'd like to cover this from an audience perspective, a developer creative perspective, and then advertisers, because we all have to make money while we're doing these things. Um, but I guess starting with audiences, fans, viewers, who are they, what do they watch, when do they want to watch it? Um, I'm going to go to Tal first. Um, the video was obviously a traditionally like a lean back experience, broadcast television, movies when you're interacting with Choose Your Adventure and other types of Echo experiences, how much is too much and how much is too much 
effort on behalf of the user? Um, a good question. I think um, that if you think about what you know, the t technological and internet revolution brought to our lives, then basically everything is interactive, right? Like our social media is like ours. It's engaging. It's personalized. It's interactive. Our games in our pockets. You know the way we. We even learn and consume information. You go down like the rabbit hole of hyperlinks on uh, Wikipedia or whatever it is. So it's like, obviously, you know, for all of us that have kids that were born recently, um, like they're growing into it. And us as like older generations, we got educated very, very, um, very, very quickly that everything is interactive. And the weird thing is that Video is the only thing that hasn't made that uh, that leap to interactivity. You still click play, and it's kind of this uh, one-way stream, like the predetermined stream that is streamed to you, uh, same stream that is streamed to everyone else. Um, so um, I think that you know we everything in our digital lives kind of trains us that there's no too much, there isn't too much interactivity, and just video trains you that. Like, why are we even asking that question around video? Even even asking that question is a little bit weird to me. It like in like 2019. Um, so, to me, it's just a matter of like you know, kind of um, the same thing that we got educated to in all of those different me mediums um, is happening now in video. Um, so, I actually don't think there is too much interactivity. Never too much interactivity. Yeah. Dan, what do you think? Um, well, the fact we're asking the question is it means that it hasn't happened yet, and I think you know. Um, Evan was kind of calling this out. Shoppable video has been around a long time as well. Shoppable video is another use case that um, we all offer up here. And I think it's, um, it's really been held back by um, a fact that we are naturally a fairly lazy species again. I don't want to be too down on ourselves because we do amazing things as people. But uh, if you can make video, and, and, and most people and brands do, um, it's a bit of extra work. So I think that to do it interactively is um, is something that's been held back by the create uh, by the brand creators by the by the sort of publishers and, and others who perhaps have, have have not had to do it. The, the real transition has been in the last I'd say year or so, and two years perhaps at most, where people have seen that audiences are now starting to really push for it themselves, and um, the interactive storytelling is just as creative as making the film in the first place. Um, and that transition has really happened in the last two years. I think we, we perhaps all um, experienced that. And it was sort of capped off with um, Netflix obvi obviously legitimizing, and that's really what they did, um, the entire space with Bandersnatch and other uh, shows that they're now making. Um, we've been involved with Kids TV, which is, to everyone's point up here, where interactivity is natural. I mean, we have um, the BBC have been using our technology for four years now. Um, they've won a BAFTA award and, and several awards in making interactive kids TV, and they're doing it all themselves. And I think in making those tools easy to use and then making, uh, the, allowing viewers really to interact uh, and giving it out, out in, that, uh, in, the, in those VOD environments, which is increasingly happening now, and Netflix have legitimized the market. It is changing quite, quite significantly so. Um, speaking of interactivity, we're going to take questions at the end. So while you're thinking of things to ask these lovely panelists, we'll, we'll save time for you at the end. Um, okay, so Beth Ann, in this interactive environment, this canvas that you have for advertisers, do they love it? Is it scary? Does, do they distract from their message? Like, how do they play in this world? I would say it's here, but they're all trying to figure out exactly what that means. And because of Netflix's success, the various p content publishers know that consumers have an alternative. The great news is that this is really about the consumer experience transforming. Hulu is very honest about the fact that they make more money if you watch the ad-supported Hulu versus the paid Hulu. And they really want to make sure that they are treating your experience with kid gloves from an advertising perspective. So you see a lot of momentum where people are cutting down on the number of ads per pod. They're giving you different options, which is wonderful and it's really breaking it open. At the same time, on the advertiser side, you have this direct to consumer momentum that's really about a more of a one to one relationship with consumers. So brands are getting on board very, very quickly with the idea that that all of their marketing needs to be more personalized, more engaging, more of a direct relationship with the consumer. So those two things coming together is really ripe for being able to think about connected TV environments as being 
innovative and bring, being able to bring this interactivity into advertising units. And many brands are doing it well. In, in any industry, you've got the early adopters who are there and are thinking about the storytelling experiences, and they're reaping great rewards. And I'll give you one example. Uh, Uber did a program where they had Spike Lee actually create the content, and it was different vignettes about the various Uber drivers. And it was done in a 15-second commercial that ultimately gave you, the consumer, the chance to use your Roku device to see more content. And the average consumer chose to spend two minutes with that content because it was really compelling. It was done by Spike Lee. And it wasn't, here's why the Uber value proposition is about getting you from A to B. It was really creating something much more interactive. So those are the type of experiences we are excited for this, this type of innovation to be able to enable. I mean, if you ever wanted to make advertising sound sexy, talk to Beth Ann about it. She can make all types of monetization experiences sound amazing, so that was great. Um, since behind us is some drawing and some illustration, and I know you guys weren't maybe expecting that, and it isn't your platforms and creative, um, I did want to give you all a moment to talk about where your technology exists in the wild. Like, how could anyone in the audience have seen Wirewax, for example, where they might, might they have seen it? Uh, well, I mentioned the BBC, so we're inside the BBC iPlayer, for example, and increasingly this is where our market growth is actually, is in VOD environments, um, Netflix and other platforms. Um, so we, we would be probably most mainstream uh, seen in those environments. Um, we also live in a sort of branded content space, and so people use us in their social and their owned and operated, and occasionally in their advertising um, as well. Um, we actually collaborate with Innovid and, and, and have a, a partnership on that level because we don't tend to see ourselves as necessarily ad tech, um, but people do use it in that way. Tell. Um, Where do you see Echo out there? Like if, you were, if anyone in the audience wanted to see one of your applications, where might they see it? So we are just about to launch uh, our programming actually next week, um, starting with collaboration with BuzzFeed. Um, so you'll see uh, some of BuzzFeed's properties uh, turning interactive video with Echo. Um, that'll be on their uh, platforms as well as on ours. Um, we are distributing um, kind of across web and mobile web. Um, we have obviously our own app. Um, so up until now, you know, we did a lot of uh, music videos, brand content, started you know releasing some pilots and shows um so you might have seen the bob dylan uh, like a rolling stone video with our technology uh, a few years back um but like real programming is starting to ramp up uh, literally next week coming here soon <laughs> and beth and as far as like cross-platform interactive monetization experiences like a campaign that people might know or have seen uh, so if you've seen any advertising for Apple, Procter & Gamble, FCA Chrysler, any Red Bull, any interactive ads from those major TV brands uh, appearing on Hulu, Apple, uh, any of those environments, we are likely the ones who help them to bring that interactivity to the ad and deliver it across uh, connected TV devices, desktop and mobile in the streaming video space. Okay, so we talked, I'm tall touched on it a little bit, but the, the notion of it, it, click to video, click to watch a video is a really one-to-one -one experience traditionally. And now as we're getting into all this interactivity and social and chat, we've gone kind of back to the living room, like where we used to all watch TV. Well, I did because I'm old, but we used to watch TV as a family and in, in a group environment and talk about the things that are happening. And even at movies, you know, people have, you know, whispering or not so whispering when they're watching movies in a big um, cinema like this. Um, and then you went to click to watch my one video on my phone or click to watch it, you know, on my laptop. And um, now we're in a video gaming world. People are talking and playing games. There's a whole virtual environment where communities are hanging out. And do you feel like we're now at a world where it's like back to social watching across the board? Um, yeah, I think it's a different kind of social watching. I think people share content um, in, a, in, a, in a different way. I don't know whether there's, I actually, I mean, I live with my girlfriend and we rarely watch the same show um, because uh, I utterly hate the content she watches and she utterly hates the content I watch. So I don't know whether the, the, those days might have passed, actually. But I think that's is why... Is like side-by-side laptops or what's happening here? Uh, this is a therapy session. Okay. Um, 
I think it's 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 just becoming much more about uh, uh, an element of personalised experience. But I think one of the interesting areas, and I think we could all perhaps tackle it better, is is that first um, person, uh, sorry, first screen experience. Um, because the interactivity doesn't necessarily need to be about uh, a solo uh, experience. It can be collaborative. I mean, you're seeing elements of it with sort of gameplay elements, of the voice and other shows like that, um, which are a little bit more progressive. And, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, that whole t uh, Mark Burnett team is, is, is always interested in those sort of elements of interactivity. So it's, it's, it's just a different kind of social experience, I think. Um, and I thought actually worth mentioning that I think one of the reasons why Netflix are exploring this is because uh, we're not just exploring it, starting to invest in it. It's because they are changing the relationship with their consumer by doing so. Um, it's, it's, we all know about hashtag streaming wars. Um, I'm just trying to keep using the hashtag. Um, I sound really young if I do so. Um, but that, that is really about um, Netflix owning a relationship with their audience. They, they, uh, when they made Bandersnatch, if you read any of the press around it, people knew that it was interactivity from Netflix, the show from Charlie Brooker. So uh, when you're paying a subscription, you start to see a value to Netflix, not just about their discovery mechanism or just the, or just the movie, because guess what? Charlie Brooker can go and sell that to Hulu or anyone else. So this creates a relationship to Netflix that they're paying for. Um, it, and I think that's why it's an interesting area for exploration for OTT and VOD. And also then, conversely, Charlie Brooker cannot make interactive shows with anyone but Netflix now. So it's an interesting value opportunity for everyone, really. Um, yeah, I think uh, like on the on the topic of, uh, of Bandersnatch, I think uh, when you look at the social aspects of it, um, the, the beautiful thing that happened is that, you know, you come to the office the next day, you know, obviously in our office everyone watched it. Um, and, um, but, you know, it's all, also conversations with people who aren't necessarily in that space. The whole conversation changed from what you thought about the show to what you did in the show. And, um, and that creates like a completely different social layer around interactive entertainment because um, it's about your role in the show. It's not about what was written for you to consume necessarily. Right. So, so I actually have the benefit of watching Echo Programming in your office and with Mark Burnett, actually. So there's a, a room of us watching and, and people were saying, do this, do this, do this, and yelling. I f it was, um, I, I forget who was driving in, in your office, but it was like, com you know, being the command central and we were all shouting, do this. No, I want to do this. But why would you? And then it was, why would you do that, right? So a lot of questioning choices when it comes to programming, which is fascinating. And I guess, you know, for, for Bandersnatch, it's like, well, what if you do it another way? And you can keep watching it, which is another, it changes the experience, which really transforms, like, the core asset, right? Yeah, and I think, uh, to your earlier point, what what is nice about it is that you see, like, you know, it's a very measurable medium, obviously, because it's all connected devices, uh, you know, um, and you just see that data speaks for itself, because when people are that involved and when they talk about it, they, they watch it much more, they share it much more, um, like their personal ownership of their entertainment becomes just so much more amplified just by the nature of the medium. So Beth, then you have to deal with all these advertisers and agencies who want accountability and all this. Do you believe it's really measurable and accountable in these spaces? Uh, oh, I think it's absolutely measurable and accountable and more so than any of the medium that we've seen come before it. And I think that's what is so exciting about Connected TV and the chance to be able to think about how we can raise it to a different level than linear is today so that it can be much more of a direct vehicle and really be able to deliver on a higher promise of more one-to-one -one communication and connection with consumers. All agreement. Okay. Um, I want to take a shift. I'm, I'm watching the time a little bit because this is a room of entrepreneurs, students, investors in entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, and you guys are all working at startups, some very, you know, very established, but, but also all startups. And, and as Dan mentioned, he did win the startup competition three years ago, three years ago here, um, which was very exciting. Um, and you know, as you're looking out at what it's like to be an entrepreneur in, in the interactive video space or overall, like, I think, do you have advice? It's number one question, but also what, what's the hardest thing that you do working in a startup, especially in an ev evolving environment like interactive video? Um, and then what's the best thing about working in a startup in the space? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's quite a challenging question. Um, 
I think the the best thing is by far and away the people. Um, when you're in a, a small environment, many people here, I'm, I'm sure, are in small environments of people. Um, you, I think, a, a businesses of a certain size, generally below 100 people, are kind of. Um, well, maybe all businesses are a representation of the human condition, right? And they're a little bit fucked up. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm, I'm very negative, but uh, there's some positives. It's, He's it's, much nicer when it's sunny outside. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, 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 it, is, it is a, it is a tortuous, obviously, at times, but it, an amazing experience of, 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 of any type being in a, in a growth business of, of your own. And, and, and I, when I say your own, I mean... Every one of our business, everyone in our business is part of it, um, and uh, and I think that the, the the challenges with that are that you have to be pretty sufficiently, um, I don't know, applicable to every single challenge that comes to, 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 towards you. You don't really have the ability to just narrow down on one lane. And if anything, we've had people join us from very large businesses. They've really struggled with that. Um, you do have to do, you know, more or less anything that, that makes the business move forward. So that's that's a challenge, I think, always. Um, but by far and away, the best thing is that you are with a close bunch of people who um, really have a common mission and, and, and do create something. And I think one of the benefits of our um, technologies up here is that we work in a very creative visual space and um, you know we mentioned Mark Burnett I mean there are amazing content creators across the world who um, are, are, are really challenging themselves with interactivity at the moment and it's a hugely exciting time in the industry to be part of that and so um, you know I know Yoni and you guys have been part of the, those storytelling exercises throughout and, and, and any of it as well it's been a, a very interesting time for all of us in that space so I find that the most interesting and validating I suppose Tal um, yeah I think um, kind of best e and yeah, e equally the best and the worst are similar things are like you know uh, when you start you know two or three people company and you know you grow to to dozens of people and, and even more um, you know to me personally you know we're around over eight years in uh, in this roller coaster ride um, and we're around close to 80 people at this stage. Um, it's kind of the, the same thing. It's just in different scale. Um, it's about, um, to Dan's point, it's you need to do so many things at once. Um, you need to be, um, to be kind of, uh, it's about connecting the team uh, to the product, to each other. Uh, working together, like embracing chaos a lot of, in a lot of, uh, um, you know, the day-to-day, -day, both both on the day-to-day -day and on the high level. Um, and specifically now, it's really, really an exciting time because you see the shift in the industry changing. You know, right now it's it's more, it has been more like in the industry, uh, but, but again, with Netflix doing like the first big move, um, it's starting to be very, very, you know, consumer-oriented and... Uh, people know, understand what it is. So it's it's like not the future anymore. It's the present. It's just here. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the hardest is getting the business model right and uh, making sure that you don't have to reimagine it. When Innovid was started, it was really focused just on the interactive units, which were sold campaign by campaign, which is limiting in terms of the size and in terms of what it would take to scale it, because you can only sell a certain number of programs per salespeople, which meant that you'd have to keep increasing the number of salespeople, et cetera. We now sell uh, more enterprise type of programs that once someone comes on the platform, they stay on the platform. We're evolving to SaaS pricing. But if you have any way to start with some type of SaaS or membership pricing, it will make an enormous difference in your ability to establish enterprise value for your company. So really think about that and identify models, even if they're not in your particular category yet. How can you get them there? Um, and then the, the most exciting thing is that moment when you realize you've made it and you've become relevant to the customers that you're trying to serve. Um, and a highlight recently was um, Mark Pritchard, who is kind of the, the grand dam of the CMOs. Uh, he's the CMO of Procter & Gamble, 
Procter & Gamble is a client of ours, and there was a big conference in France, and he was with the, uh, pres the CEO of EMEA for P&G, and as they were walking um, past an Innovid booth, he said, oh, we work with them, you need to know them, spend time there. And when the gentleman who was on the panel came out of it, the CEO of P&G, EMEA, was waiting for him, and it was that moment of, Five years ago when I got there, Mark Pritchard had no idea who Innovid was, and now we are very much on his radar and able to have earn the right to have had those top-to-top -top meetings because we don't think of ourselves as a technology platform. We are the ones who are helping them to tell new creative, innovative stories um, in this new medium of connected TV, and that makes us essential. So, I was just going to say on that, actually, Mark Pritchard, I think, is one of the people who recently um, said that yeah, creativity is the one thing he'll always pay for from P&G. And I think that, that, that whenever we think about the word X factor, which I, I do, I, I will, I'll watch the show as well, um, you do, that's what comes to my, my, in my mind, creativity. And that's the thing that drives forward stories and, and, and excitement and engagement with what you're doing. And it's part of what I think we're all seeing up here as well, is um, the brands are just bringing a lot more um, in-house and starting to take a lot more control over that X factor and that creativity and I think that's equally why interactive storytelling has managed to get such a, a growth spurt over the last year or so because of that taking ownership over their messaging. Well and the consumer can add to the creative level so yeah. as many tools and, and opportunities as you can give with your platforms and they can go ahead and change the game too as well right it's super exciting. Okay so creative brains we're going to do word association and then we take questions. All right, so. Each of you is going to get one word and then just respond with the first thing that comes to your mind. Ready? You can pass, but but it's got to go fast. All right, YouTube. Vimeo. Snapchat. Kids. Video gaming. Teenagers. VR. AR. Facebook Watch. Attempts. <laughs> Pokemon Go. Irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Pokemon Go is my forever example of AR when people go, what is AR? It's very handy, so not so irrelevant. Um, podcast. Spotify. Amazon. Sorry? Amazon. Scale. <laughs> Netflix. Essential. Pre-roll. Ah, uh, it's essential. Pizza rat. What? <laughs> Pizza rat. I'm not sure what that even means. Pizza rat? Pass. Dan. Pizza rat? Um, pass back to you. Why don't you answer that? Audience. Pizza rat? <laughs> so it was the one of the larger viral videos coming out of New York City. Of course it was. Yeah, I knew that. It's fine. Okay. So now you can all look up the video for pizza rat. And, and on a Brilliant. day like this, it's a perfect day for pizza rat. Okay. So the, my last thing is the future of video is... Experimental. The future video is? Choice driven. The future video is? Relevant and engaging for consumers. Fabulous. Thank you. And, you, and none of you said the future video is interactive, which is fully what I was expecting. Oh, so. <laughs> too default, isn't it? <laughs> All right, questions from the audience. Hi, Simon. I'm the producer and host of Tomorrow Will Be Televised, the promo by television on Blog Talk Radio and iHeart Radio. And Tom, one thing in this audience that people should know is that this fall, Echo is going to become an interactive TV service as part of Voodoo, that's Walmart's video on demand venture, which is also doing original programming. What are you doing for them? And secondly, does the deal with Walmart allow Echo to do its own interactive television service on smart TV sets? Thank you. Um, so uh, just for a little bit of context, um, for those of you who don't know, um, we closed a big commercial deal with Walmart at the end of last year. They've invested uh, somewhere close to over a quarter billion dollars uh, in content on our platform. Um, so to your question, um, that money and that investment uh, goes to creation of original programming on Echo. Um, fiction, non-fiction, uh, many, many different ranges, lengths, with many, many different partners, um, and integrating many, many uh, different uh, brands and advertisers, um, not only Walmart themselves. Um, hope that answers the question. Uh, as to integration with Voodoo, um, this is not something I can discuss yet. Thank you. 
questions over there? Hi, my name is Zach from Circle Optics. We make 360 cameras that eliminate post-production work from VR. Mm -hmm. One question I've got is on a topic from last year. A lot of virtual reality content today is three-minute pieces, short kind of passive films. Where do you see the future of immersive content going and how do you think we can bring interactivity to virtual reality? Tal, you wanna start, Dan? Um, yeah, I can start because we have uh, dabbled with it, uh, yeah. Um, the way I see, at least, you know, I and we at Echo, we see interactivity, it's more of a new way to tell a story, rather than, you know, the medium right now, the reason we're focusing very much our technological efforts on, you know, delivering it to your mobile devices, because all of us has mobile devices in our pockets. Um, but that same, um, you know, medium and ability to tell stories in a different way than the linear way you've been used to tell video stories, um, is very applicable to many different uh, mediums and formats like VR. So um, we have done like a, an Echo VR film. Um, I think it was uh, 2017. My memory is pretty bad. Um, which, you know, it's, it's the same thing. You make choices. In that case, you made choices by just looking uh, instead of like tapping. Um, and you just looked around and uh, the character you chose to look at and followed uh, branched the story um, that way. So I think that's just an example of how um, VR is just a different canvas for the same, uh, same kind of mindset. Yeah, I would just follow on with that by going back to my analogy at the start really because you, when you make a film, um, you think about the storyboard, the shots, you, sit, you, you think about the cameras you're gonna use, you think about the lenses, you think about a drone shot. Those are all creative decisions. I think um, part of the problem of interactive video and even Bandersnatch to some extent um, is that it, it, it simplifies what is an entire tool set range. I mean, even before this presentation, we're seeing a completely different take on it. HQ trivia, people classify that as interactive video. It's very different each time. And with that, you have very different creative approaches. So um, the tools you use are going to be different for each shot. They're going to be different for each execution. I don't think it matters about how short or long form it is. I'm really interested to see um, Quibi's approach coming out, uh, I think, next year now. Um, it's uh, obviously now a $2 billion investment from Hollywood. Um, and uh, they're doing some really inter interesting interactive features on that. And um, it's interesting because it's coming from... Hollywood itself, a lot of people uh, involved in that. So it, it's it's not about, um, and we often get asked the question actually, how many hotspots should we have and all this sort of thing. I don't think it's about that. I think it's about you know what story you're trying to tell, then just apply uh, the creative tools to fit that um, when you're making it. Yes, Mr. Hammock. Hi, uh, Pete Hammock from uh, Bench Equity. Um, you seem relatively, or at least some of you, seem a little dismissive of video gaming, and yet there's some parallels I see with, between interactive video and video gaming, oh, with synthetic video and things like that. How do you see video gaming and interactive video converging or differentiating themselves? I pass, since I am obsessed with video gaming, used to work in the business. <laughs> I know. I would say that um, we're not dismissive about video gaming at all. Uh, having lost both of my teenage sons to that <laughs> ecosystem and watching them get completely absorbed in it, um, I recognize the power that it has and the social component it, it has had for them and the relevance across all uh, all different generations. Um, I I, equivale, I equated it to teenagers because that's that's what my experience has been but i think it's a very relevant example of interactivity and how brands i look at it from an advertising perspective and how brands can absolutely um, create demand for their products in very different ways and i think we're just scratching the surface of what's possible there i'm, I'm very bullish on that as a future storytelling venue um yeah um I, I, I'm not sure where you got the dismissive part. Like, like I really, uh, personally, you know, we really believe at Echo. Um, one of our challenges, like I'll, I'll maybe I'll start with that. One of the challenges is when you think about, you know, video and live action and actors on screen, then we are very, you know, we're very absorbed in the way of doing things over the past many, many decades, um, which is, again, very, very linear perception. This is how you write scripts. This is how you edit. Like, um, so... 
to us, we take a lot, a lot, a lot of inspiration from games. We actually, we have game nights, like every week the entire office, uh, you know, gets together and play games, mostly narrative games, because, you know, these, these are the closest to cracking what telling a nonlinear story in a good way is. Um, and they have their different technical challenges, um, and very different audience, but the inspiration for great interactivity in, in that new medium, um, that, you know, gaming is the closest there is to that. Um, so a lot of inspiration. Yeah, very quickly, I was just going to say, I think they're very different. I think games are very, very about, much about getting really involved. Um, interactive video and its use cases, as you hear from here, about advertising, news gathering, more interesting ways of interacting in a short period of time sometimes. So it, the very, the, there is a lot more variance in the use case for interactive video than there is a, a game which you're meant to absorb yourself in. I think that's the primary difference, but we're not dismissive, I think we've all said. <laughs> so we're over time, but are you? One question, quick. Brian, you got a quick one? Sure. Hi, Brian. Hi, Brian Storm from Media Storm. I'm curious if you guys have uh, ideas on interactive experiences aside from like choose your own adventure, which seems to dominate the category. What, what are you excited about? What do you see that you're like, man, that's a cool idea. That's where we should be headed. I think for, for us, it's actually um, one of our strongest use cases is something nobody really wants to know about. It's boring subject matter, trying to make it more interesting. And um, we've got a lot of um, healthcare actually who's, who's using the technology to tell stories about how you're using particular drugs, how you're going to go through a cancer treatment. Um, these, uh, these are not about choosing a particular decision point. These are about adding layers of information where you need it um, and where you don't, you carry on. Um, and so I think it's... Uh, I think about the sort of head-up display when I think about this. I think about give me information around the screen at very relevant points that I can interact with if I choose to do so. And that's all of this, by the way. This is all of this is about making you, each one of you, part of the process of deciding what's interesting, what's relevant, and where you want to go on. And that's, by the way, the same with Bandersnatch. If you didn't interact, it still played you a story. Um, and that's the way it should be, in my, in my view. And for me, I would say that it's about pulling content into the actual ad unit and giving the consumer the chance to experience more and understand more about what that brand might represent, um, as well as using some basic tools like expand and extend to tell longer stories and or bring more social responsibility stories into the mix. If you're advertising shampoo, but you as a major corporation are investing a ton of money in water projects around the globe, there are consumers for whom that's really relevant. And instead of having to choose where you're going to put a dollar against one story or the other, there's no reason that you can't bring them together and give the consumer the chance to learn more. So I think the extension of the, the vehicle of, of an ad unit as a larger storytelling uh, platform in Canvas is very exciting and still very, quite untapped. Do you want to wrap yeah. it up? Um, yeah, quick. Um, so I think, you know, choose your own adventure and choose your own editing and, and those type of things are are just what makes it accessible to describe to people um, because, again, it's a new medium and no one knows yet what it's going to be. Um, so, you know, I think it's just about creating different additional layers to a story and making it nonlinear, again, like many of our digital lives already is. So we just need to all, with again, with the best creator of the, creators, creators of the world, actually just understand how you tell those stories, how how you think about story in a nonlinear way. Um, and, you know, I don't want to do spoilers for some of the shows that we're going to put out later this year, but uh, ideally we're going to um, start to demonstrate what, you know, what, it, what it's about, that it's not just about choosing, you know, go left or go right. Tell better stories. Tell better stories. Thank you guys all so much for being here. Thank you very much. Come a round of applause.